Shortly after I graduated from Cambridge with a doctorate in transplant immunology, I received an assignment to harvest organs from executed prisoners. I accepted this as the cost of pioneering a new complex surgery for my country. While at Cambridge, I had trained for three years under transplant pioneer Sir Roy Khan. A large part of this training involved flying in small aircraft to hospitals within the UK and Europe to retrieve organs from mostly road trauma victims. At 35, I returned home and successfully performed Singapore's first liver transplant and became godmother to my patient's son some six years later. My patient remains alive and well today, a quarter century later, and is among Asia's longest surviving recipients of a cadaveric donor liver. This initial success encouraged the development of a multi-organ transplant program, which, however, faced a major challenge of an acute shortage of donor organs in a country with a population of just 3 million at the time. A program to harvest organs from executed prisoners was launched. Till today, I still vividly recall walking through the high security prison on Friday mornings at 5 a.m. Though I always kept my gaze straight, I could feel the haunting stares of the 18 to 20 inmates on death row follow my every footstep as I made my way to the makeshift operating room. There, in the absolute stillness of the pre-dawn, my team and I would await the arrival of the prisoner following his execution by hanging. We would know this by the sound of an audible click, then an eerie silence of 10 to 15 minutes while the medical examiner on duty pronounced the prisoner dead. This was then followed by the noisy rattling sounds of a trolley wheeled in haste down the corridor with a prisoner, a blue hood covering his head, fresh from his execution. I remained on the prison's organ retrieval team for several years and through a pregnancy. What kept me going was to focus my thoughts on the recipients whose lives would be saved by this procedure. While my patients knew the source of their donor organs, it was never once brought up as a topic for discussion or deliberation. Put yourselves in their shoes for a moment. Would you reject an organ from an executed prisoner if it could save your life? During those early years of my surgical career, the lab was my sanctuary. It was where I could gather my thoughts, focus my mind, and think up solutions to the issues in transplantation which troubled me. There is today a disproportionate shortage of donor organs in comparison to the exponential increase in the number of recipients on the wait list, and the gap continues to widen. While living donors, both related and unrelated, have come forward to altruistically donate a kidney or a part of a liver, yet the gift of life remains a scarce resource. I pondered this acute shortage of donor organs and considered the use of cells. At that time, islet cells harvested from donor pancreases were being investigated as a cure for diabetes. The concept was to transplant these insulin-secreting islet cells rather than a whole pancreas. I visited David Sutherland's lab at the University of Minnesota a leader in pancreas and islet transplants in the winter of 1988. There, it appeared that three donor pancreases were required to harvest enough islet cells to treat just one diabetic patient. 
what was needed was the ability to scale up, expand, and multiply the cells in the lab. Stem cells seem the answer. Stem cells, as undifferentiated, immature cells, had the potential to multiply to large numbers and differentiate into a variety of different cell types. Heart, liver, kidney cells, neurons, bone cartilage, and insulin-secreting cells. Of the three main types of stem cells, embryonic stem cells, controversial to some, are pluripotent and can be differentiated into any cell type in the body. Recently, embryonic stem cells have been successfully differentiated into retinal pigment epithelium cells, the specialized cells that line the back of the eye. The hope here is to cure age-related macular degeneration, one of the most common causes of vision loss in the developed world today. The other type of stem cell is the adult stem cell, which, as its name implies, is derived from adult tissue in you and me, in our bone marrow, blood, and fat. In just this decade, adult stem cells have been implanted in human hearts in clinical trials. Heart failure has become an epidemic disease crying out for innovation. It is still unclear whether these stem cells add value by delivering growth factors to help in the recovery of the damaged heart muscle, or whether these cells differentiate into heart muscle cells. It is also unclear whether these cells even remain in the treated areas and become integrated or migrate and get washed out of the heart. These issues are currently being investigated in clinical trials. The most recent stem cell type is the induced pluripotent stem cell, or iPS cell, first discovered in 2006 and for which John Gurdon and Shinya Yamanaka were jointly awarded the 2012 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. This discovery has made it possible to turn back the clock, to take mature adult cells as in a skin biopsy, and in the lab, reprogram these old cells into youthful cells, termed iPS cells. These iPS cells are pluripotent, almost like embryonic stem cells, and can be differentiated into virtually any cell type in the body. Remarkably, the world's first clinical application of iPS cells was reported in a 70-year-old woman just last year. Here, Japanese scientists took her skin biopsy and in the lab reprogrammed her old skin cells into youthful iPS cells, then grew a sheet of retinal pigment epithelium cells which they implanted into her eye to treat her age-related macular degeneration. There is intense interest in iPS cells as it has the same pluripotent potential as embryonic stem cells, but without some of the ethical concerns. So with the promise of stem cells as building blocks to create tissues, the next step was to design and manufacture scaffolds in order to build three-dimensional organs. There has been tremendous innovation in the fields of material science and bioengineering in creating different types of scaffolds, both natural and synthetic. With 3D printing technology, coupled with the use of cells as a form of bio-ink, it has been possible to print the simple flat structures like skin and the hollow tubular structures like blood vessels and upper airway tubes. But what about the more complex organs like the heart and the liver, which comprise many more cells with a complex vascular architecture? Would it be possible to print a liver 
using cells seeded onto a scaffold in the lab. What's been possible so far is to print not a whole liver, but tiny sheets of liver tissue for drug toxicity testing, and as patches to potentially graft onto damaged livers. In the future, it may be possible to bioengineer human organs in situ, even reprogram the human body to heal itself without the need to rely on donor organs. Alongside advances in, in bioengineering organs, there has been tremendous innovation in surgeries to transplant these organs. This is especially so since robotic surgical systems gained FDA approval at the turn of the century. On the left of the slide is the open platform Zeus robot by Computer Motion Industries in Santa Barbara, sadly no longer in existence. And on the right is the current state-of-the-art Da Vinci robot from Intuitive Surgical, headquartered in Sunnyvale in California. While conventional transplant surgeries are performed through large open incisions, robotic systems enable surgeries to be performed through tiny incisions. Robotic surgical systems provide the surgeon with a three-dimensional, 10 times magnified view of the operative field. Seven degrees of freedom of movement of fine wristed instruments, motion scaling, and filtration of tremor. These robotic instruments enter the human body through multiple sub-centimeter incisions, and it is these small incisions that facilitate a much faster recovery for the patient. Living donors can now donate a kidney or a part of a liver using robotic technology. To facilitate this, natural orifices have been explored in the most inventive way as novel access routes for the introduction and removal of donor organs. In July 2015, the first robotic living-related kidney transplant through the vagina was performed in Toulouse in France. And why not natural orifices? Our group has published that it may be practical to transplant islet cells in the rectum, though the current method is to seed these cells within the liver. Theoretical advantages of a rectal approach include ease of access as an outpatient procedure, very much like the injection of hemorrhoids, and ease of access for repeat biopsies where required. Surgical theatres of the future will be equipped with advanced imaging devices, robotic technologies, and augmented reality. Like a pilot in a cockpit, the surgeon seated at the console has a three-dimensional magnified view of the operative field and real-time access to patient data. As of now, the surgeon is in full control of the robots. With artificial intelligence, it may be possible to automate and add precision to some of the more complex surgical tasks, the repetitive ones, such as suturing within the deep confines of the human body. Today, it is a diversified team of experts, not just surgeons, but computer scientists and engineers whose collective innovations continue to push the envelope and revolutionize the field of organ transplants. It is a momentous time in medicine, truly a privilege to be here in Berkeley and to be at the intersection of academic medicine and patient health care. Looking back, I would never have imagined that the child I was carrying while harvesting donor organs in the prisons, would grow up to be a student researcher 
in a lab in Berkeley. Go Bears. <laughs> Access to education and information empowers us to consider and debate the new and disruptive technologies in a wider scheme of things, help find solutions, and steer the way forward. Bioengineering organs from stem cells is still in its infancy, but coupled with advances in robotic technology and artificial intelligence, will someday redefine how organs are repaired and replaced. It is a brave new world of possibilities, one that has been termed the fourth industrial revolution. As we push forward, we as surgeons, scientists, and engineers may need to remind ourselves what it means to be human, and when to hold back on some of the new disruptive technologies that threaten our moral compass and our humanity. At least for the foreseeable future, the human touch will remain an indispensable embedded component in patient care. Thank you.